Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ed Begley Jr. Thank you. I'm very grateful to be asked to be here. Health has always been uh, something very dear to me and I know to all of you. And uh, when I got involved in 1970 with environmental matters, I did it for health reasons. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But I want to thank the, uh, Dr. George Benjamin for having me here today. He's terrific. What a great show so far, isn't it? Hasn't it been wonderful? Uh, and I am here also because of uh, the wonderful group. I sit on the board of Eco America, a great group that is trying to promote messages, positive messages about the environment as regards climate change and what we can do about it. So I thank uh, everybody there at Eco America that, for having me be part of this. They have a momentous campaign that you'll learn more about in the show. But I want to talk about how the environment is very clearly a health issue uh, and has been for me since 1970 because I was born in 1949 in Los Angeles and I'm sure there's some people out there who know the way the air was in the 50s and 60s in Los Angeles and by 1970 when somebody came up with the idea of the first Earth Day and they said we're gonna one of the things we're gonna do is clean up the air I went sign me up because I'd lived two decades with that horrible choking smog in the Los Angeles area. I lived in the San Fernando Valley, kind of in the center of the valley, and people would come from out of town and go, why do they call it a valley? They couldn't quite understand why it was called a valley, because you couldn't see any of the mountains. You had to be within a quarter mile of the Santa Monica Mountains or the Verdugo Hills or the Simi Hills, San Gabriel's, any of the mountain ranges till you would even see them. And it wasn't just aesthetically, you know, displeasing, it hurt your lungs on those third stage smog alerts, that's what, what they used to call them then. They would have kids stop exercising, but just to sit in the bench, hurt your lungs. So by 1970, when they started doing things like, uh, you know, Earth Day, uh, and they talked about not only the air, but the water. They said, we have a problem with our water too, with the, uh, you know, the ocean. And I knew that was real, because I'd been out to the Santa Monica Bay and seen the horrible pollution there in the Santa Monica Bay. And, uh, and so I wanted to do something to, to change that. And that was 45 years ago now, and I can tell you, I'm hopeful about the environment. I'll tell you why I say that. Because even though we have four times the cars in LA since 1970, millions more people, we have a fraction of the smog. We all did that. We own a piece of that. Everybody here in this room that's promoted public health, and the people at the American Lung Association, who I know are represented here today, those great heroes at the American Lung Association, Gladys Mead in LA, and others, help get the public health message out there about the environment. Because otherwise, people thought, oh, I just want to, you know, let's save the owls, and we'll save the whales, and we've got to save the redwoods. All that's all worthy efforts. I like all that. But what about the people? And the people were being harmed, uh, you know, quite seriously from it. I was a good friend of Cesar Chavez, a great union leader and friend of mine, Dr. Cesar, uh, Dr. Saint Cesar Chavez. Um, I had the honor and the uh, sadness of carrying his coffin through the streets of Delano back in 1993. And, uh, but he was a guy who saw the effects to the people, you know, about uh, uh, overuse and abuse with pesticides and what have you. And people would bring that stuff home in their clothing and what have you. And they, were, they had a lot of problems and people were suffering from that. So uh, I got involved with his movement back in the 60s, and I got involved in 1970 with the environment. And let me tell you what I did and why I did it. And I gotta give credit to my dad, Ed Begley Sr. Anybody remember an actor, Ed Begley Sr.? Okay. Great actor, he's in 12 Angry Men, uh, 12 Angry Men. He was in Sweet Bird of Youth, he won an Oscar for that. And he was a conservative that liked to conserve. We turn off the lights, we turn off the water, we save string, we save tin foil. He was the son of Irish immigrants. He had lived through the Great Depression. And he would always tell me when I complained about the smog, he'd say, Eddie, I know what you're against. You're against the smog, I'm against the smog. But what are you for? What are you doing about it? I kind of just, you know, grumbled about that for a while in my teens. But then he died within a few days of the first Earth Day in 1970. And I wanted to do something and I thought of him. 
you know, what am I doing to make a difference with the, smog, with the smog? So I started recycling and I started composting. I started buying all biodegradable soaps and detergents. I became a vegetarian. I, and most importantly, I bought an electric car. People think I'm making that up, buying an electric car in 1970. They didn't exist. There were electric cars in 1910. Henry Ford's wife preferred her Baker Electric to uh, his noisy contraption, so they were around a while. I couldn't afford a fancy car like that, like my friend Jay Leno has one of those cars. I had a, a Taylor Dunn electric car in 1970. When I say car, I'm being quite grand. We're talking about a golf cart with a windshield wiper and a horn, okay? <laughs> it had a top speed of 20 miles an hour. Talk about a public health nuisance, you know, it was probably uh, causing traffic accidents behind me going 20 miles an hour. I wouldn't go on the freeway, of course, but still even on surface streets. It was, you know, didn't go very far, very fast, but I was doing something and I right away realized, you know, that it was cheaper to plug into the wall than it was to buy 1970 gasoline. 1970 gasoline was plenty cheap, but 1970 kilowatt hours were cheap too, and it was just cheaper to go X amount of miles, 20 miles in that car, plugging it in than it was 20 miles worth of gas. And it was much cheaper to maintain. There's no tune-up or oil change or fan belt or radiator flush or smog check or valve job, any of that stuff. And so I stayed with it. I thought that stuff was great. I had one kind of a mishap, though. I actually took a young lady out on a date in the electric car. Now, an electric car is not exactly what you'd call a babe magnet. I took the actress Cindy Williams out on a date in it. And you remember Cindy Williams from Laverne and Shirley? She played Shirley. Great actress, great friend of mine. I took her out on a date back in 1970, and um, she did not grant me a second date. <laughs> I don't think I'd fully charge it, so we were kind of crawling up to the restaurant on the date. There was a kid on Hot Wheels passing us by. So uh, I graduated up the ladder and got a, a, 90, uh, a 73 Subaru that was converted to electric or what have you, and then went you know, 45 miles. Ooh, 45, Katie barred the door. But the point of all this was that it was all affordable. People regularly say, well, I can't afford a fancy electric car like you have today. You got a Nissan Leaf, I can't afford that. I can't afford a solar system like you have. And I understand, I couldn't either when I started in 1970. This doesn't have to break the bank. The naysayers about climate change says, hey, I'd like to do something too. The ones that believe in it say they want to do something, but we just can't afford it. I'm telling you, everything I've done for the environment from 1970 has been good for the environment and good for my pocketbook. Everything. I started, you, you know, you don't run up Mount Everest. I couldn't afford solar panels in 1970. I couldn't afford, you know, a wind turbine I bought in 1985 out in the California desert. I couldn't afford a fancy electric car. The electric car I bought in 1970 was $950. It was a fine price. But everything that I did, all the things that I could that were inexpensive, the recycling, taking public transportation, uh, riding about public transportation. I want to thank the CTA. I, of course, took the CTA all around here today. You got a good system here in Chicago. <laughs> Normally, when I have the time, I drive my hybrid cross country. I would have come here in my hybrid, but I was shooting yesterday and I have to shoot tomorrow. Uh, so I had it fly in, but you take the blue line in, it's easier than driving. It's great. All this stuff, good for the environment good for your bottom line. The naysayers about climate change say, you know, it's just too expensive, we can't do it. I would certainly concede, as I hope everybody in this room would, would concede, that there are jobs at, you know, refineries and oil derricks and in coal mines, those are jobs, and the money goes back in the community. Well, why is it not the same with solar panel companies and wind turbine companies that people make energy efficient thermostats and energy saving light bulbs, isn't that? Those are jobs, too. And if you do it in the right order, and that's the message that we at Eco America promote, and please come by our booth uh, and, and, and say hello there. I'll be there for a while, too. That it is affordable, it can be affordable, it must be affordable. Um, you know, I, I, you don't run up Mount Everest. You get to base camp and you get acclimated and you do what you can. People make a list of those things they cannot do. Well, we can't, I can't afford the X and Y and Z. Well, can you afford a light bulb? Can you afford an energy-saving thermostat? Can you afford some weather stripping? Can you afford to take public transportation? Can you afford to ride a bike when weather and fitness permit? I know not in January here, I understand. I've been here in January. I was riding a bike along the lake in, uh, around Thanksgiving a couple years ago, and it was a little chilly. God bless the people that ride in that weather. I'm not one of them anymore, I'm 66. I'm slowing down a little bit. But all this stuff can be affordable, it must be affordable. And when you think of the big goal 
which is not only to do something about climate change, which I hope most people in this room agree is real, um, by doing things that are combat climate change, you're also going to clean up the air in our cities, lessen our dependence on foreign oil, and put money in your pockets. And now with the work of the American Lung Association, with the work of the Coalition for Clean Air, four times the cars in LA, millions more people, yet a fraction of the smog. A Santa Monica Bay that was so polluted is coming back to life because of all the work that we've done. It's a, the environment is a public health issue. And that's we have, the way we have to frame it. And you have the wonderful HAIP, Health in All Policies program, that I certainly subscribe to. And I'm so anxious to see some of the other uh, speakers later. There's some great uh, programs that are going to be on today. Uh, and I have, to, I have to leave to film later today, but I'm going to stick around for a lot of it. Get out there and go to all the booths and see all the breakout sessions, be part of that, see all the different presentations here on this stage, and uh, there's going to be some great stuff. And please check out Eco America, our booth that we have here, and keep working for this wonderful organization with these great people. Look, we got the Surgeon General here, for God's sake. I mean, this is fantastic. Uh, great people united for the common goal of uh, you know, public health. And the way you folks have advocated for so many other wonderful areas around public health. You're an incredible organization. I'm just honored to be here and keep up the good work in any way that I can help you in those efforts. Please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin.